<laughs> Hi, welcome back to my channel. I was trying to do a whole studio vlog this week, but things just got quite crazy, but I filmed little bits of it. So I was thinking of whilst I get do my makeup right now, I'll go through what I've been up to this week because it's been quite busy. <laughs> so Monday, I I did like a huge to-do list. I was just so impressed with myself that I got through my to-do list. Everything I use is completely cruelty free. I always start with primer. I like to mix it up with my um, moisturizer. I'm loving this Body Shop one. Um, it's a vitamin C one. Anyway. Tuesday went into London. I'm still trying on Tuesday. I was trying to do like a little vlog of what my day looks like when I go into London, but it is just so like I always try and put all my meetings and, and everything um, <laughs> all on the same day. And actually, Tuesday was so nice because my friend Anna from The Tongue was in my I work in a co working space, so she was also there. Um, and my friend Mabel, who does the Avengers, was also there. So it was just so nice to spend time with them. And when I go into London, I always try and make my, try and like socialize as much as I can. Cause that's what really what my co-working space is for so that I can like not lose my mind working alone at home. <laughs> um, so I also um, had um, met up with my co-host, my podcast co-host Venus and we had a little meeting about the podcast then we also both had a meeting with my friend Emma from Gal Cal um, and we're working on something really exciting and then that night my friend Venus also did um, a talk at Glamour a shapewear company talking about your shapewear feminist and it was just so interesting style influencey things and then I mix that with some um, ranting on Twitter and, <laughs> and arguing with racists and arguing with fat people and all of that kind of stuff so I'm a bit active as a me on, on, on Twitter and Instagram and I currently am writing my first book. Yay. 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 Um, we're talking about body positivity but from an intersectional point of view as opposed to kind of like the main body positivity that we have at the moment. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Hannah. I actually work at Heist. So, I guess we're here tonight because I've only been at Heist for like three months and it is the question I've been asked most, basically, since I started working at Heist. It's like, oh, how do you feel about working on Shapewear? And not just, like, not necessarily from people, actually, even more from the media, particularly since um, <coughs> Shapewear's been a bit more in the media recently because of, um, you know, Kardashians and things like that. It's actually not something I thought about really that much before I started. And I guess I would consider myself to be a feminist. So it's actually quite interesting to be challenged about that quite a lot in terms of what you do for your work every day. So yeah, I'm sort of interested to discuss it a little, like a little bit more discursively um, hi, I'm Venus Libido. I'm an illustrator, presenter, and mental health activist. Um, I do a lot of drawings about mental health, about body confidence, about just generally being a woman alone in our bedrooms and what we do. Um, I also have a TV show called Private Parts, which is a sex positive chat show with people like Kenny Jones, Charlie Craggs, um, and I also have a podcast which is called The Luminous Collaboration Podcast, which is about basically the luminous epidemic we're all facing at the moment. So yeah, that's me. 
Hi, I'm Michelle Elman. I run the like page Scar Not Scared. You might know me online as Scar Not Scared, which is a campaign I started um, after I had 15 surgeries from a brain tumor, punctured intestine, struck valves into my brain, and a condition called hydrocephalus. So lots of surgeries, lots of scars, and that landed me in the world of body positivity. So I now work as a body confidence coach, a body positive activist, I'm an author of the book Am I Ugly, and I'm a public speaker, which allows me here today. <laughs> Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Necessarily about labelling it anything, whether it's feminist or anti-feminist, but question that thought, because when we say it's our choice, is it a free choice though? Where did we learn those messages from? We've learned those messages from the patriarchy that there's a certain way to look, mm -hmm. and if a product is getting you closer to that, are you going to be okay without that product or are you dependent on that product to now feel okay in yourself? And I think there's almost like this reliance on a product and a dependency on a product to the, in a very similar way makeup can sometimes happen where you start playing with it, it's fun at first, but then you get to a point where you won't be in the house without it. Then how much of it is your actual free choice anymore or how much of it is actually the fear of not having it and because it's almost being used as a psychological crutch. Yeah. We were talking earlier as well, I mean, bras are essentially shapewear, they're compressing or lifting or molding your body to be a certain way, but because they're so normalised and, you know, that's much more accepted, I think we kind of don't unpack that as much as we do with something like a traditional style of shapewear. Um, and it is that, you know, we do have to question why are we wearing it. And I was saying upstairs how bra was definitely the, one of the things that I had to question. When I first went into body positivity, I would have been like, but I'm choosing to wear a bra. And then I was like, well actually, would I leave the house without a bra? And the answer was no. So I forced myself to leave the house without a bra. And I discovered things like, actually, if you don't wear a bra, the stairs are really bloody difficult. <laughs> um, you get under boob sweat, that kind of thing. But I forced myself to do that only because I really believe it, especially with my platform facts and what I preach. But if I had just been like not in the body positive movement in the same way I am and with my platform, would I have actively challenged that thought? Probably not. I would have just carried on saying like, oh, bras are my choice, I choose to wear them without actually like critically analysing that thought. Yeah. So what you said as well, I think any time we talk about anything to do with feminism, it's so important to talk about the intersectional intersectionalities within it as well. So um, in the lead up to this, this is like by no way like an official kind of um, poll or whatever, but I went on to Twitter and I asked my followers, um, specifically black women and non black women of colour, do you wear shapewear and if so what do you use it for? And 75% of people said that they don't wear shapewear and the ones that do wear it to accentuate as opposed to cover up. So I think it's, and that's because, you know, if we talk about sort of standards of beauty within different um, demographics, um, it's normally like Af Afro Caribbean communities who've sort of been raised to see um, curvy women as the beauty ideal, and I think it's the opposite, in, in, in not in those spaces as well. So it's interesting that. Um, from the little sort of poll that I've done, the women use it to accentuate and actually they want to make their, you know, use their bums or their boobs or their thighs bigger as opposed to, you know, mm -hmm. slimming it down. So I don't think in terms of the actual piece of shape there, like you said, I don't think it's, can they be like, like feminist or anti-feminist, it's just a thing that's there and if people, it's all about how people intend to use it. I think it's all to do with the intention of the future. Yeah. I mean, I kind of agree with like, I have period pants that I wear like, all the time because they are amazing showing my body such an amazing shape and it's just about comfort. Um, but I kind of have two ways in which I kind of want it to progress. I guess it's firstly stop shaming other women for what they choose to wear and stop labelling things as, as we said, feminist or anti-feminist because everyone has a choice. Secondly, I kind of want to get men included in this conversation because there's a lot of men that wear shapewear, especially when it comes to things like drag um, and things like that. And I think it'd be really interesting to start including them in campaigns and photographing them wearing shapewear because I think they wear it for men to wear just as much as women. And I would love to see that as a progression into the future. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because if more men wore it, it would such it wouldn't be so feminist or anti you know, it would just be a, this is something that people wear, yeah. and it's comfortable, or it's practical, yeah. or it's X, Y, Z, yeah. I think because it is such a thing that women... Yeah, it shouldn't wear. just be about us, it yeah. should yeah. be about yeah. men as well.
there's going to be a bit controversial, but like there's a lot of moral superiority happening in body positivity at the moment in terms of people thinking they're better than other people because they have the ability to leave the house makeup free or without shapewear. And we just have to look at the complexity of that in terms of like if you have clear skin versus if you don't, like you leaving the house with no makeup is really easy to do if you have clear skin. Um, the same with shapewear, if you have a more um, conventional beauty kind of shape, then of course it's a lot easier for you to do that. So we shouldn't be, in the same way that you were saying, we shouldn't be judging each other. And just because you're further down the process of body confidence and your body confidence journey doesn't mean you should be judging people who are further behind or struggling with their own body image. I loved um, like that whole ex experience and um, honestly had so much respect for the brand, um, for the shapewear company for wanting to actually open up and have that conversation. I think it was so cool. Now I'm using the Revolution Fast Based Concealer. So yeah, Tuesday was super fun and it was just so nice to like, sometimes meetings back to back can be exhausting, but they were just with like my friends. So it was, it felt really like, just chill. Wednesday I did the announcement that I'm doing um, a series about politics, I'm trying to learn about politics on my Instagram um, and I have a time lapse of that. Roll the clip. <laughs> Wednesday, Wednesday, um, what else did I do on Wednesday? I feel like I did something else. Wednesday, I met the Angry Nipple. <laughs> Amazing, I love what they do. We had a, she interviewed me. 
and um, yeah ask me some really interesting questions that I haven't been asked so that was um, really fun now I'm pretty sure this is like the wet and wild um, eyebrow palette I don't know anything about makeup and um, yeah the angry nipple was, was um, super fun and really nice to like finally meet her she also interviewed my publishers in a really cool interview so I'll link that below um, and then my publishers had a really cool event for a pre-launch of their next book which is all about um, illegal abortion in Brazil and I'm also going to link that below the night I'm going to roll some clips of the night because it, it was just so emotional so moving and also just kind of gave me an enormous sense of urgency about like abortion rights all over the world I mean I'm half Chilean so I know what's going on in Chile but uh, this project is such an important project and just such an amazing way of sharing um these women's stories um without like their their stories are being heard but their identities are being protected because it's a book um made by a photographer who's um you'll see in the clips that sh she shows her face but she um protecting the women's identities but then it's paired with the stories in both english and then um the original version in in portuguese so i'm going to roll some clips of that because that was an amazing really powerful night <laughs> Travelled around her native Brazil, meeting women who have had or witnessed illegal abortions, and these are the women whose faces you cannot see, but whose stories you can on the walls. And if you haven't had a chance to peruse them, you can this evening. And there will, of course, be an accompanying book peruse. I do urge you to do so. It's such a vital, important book for the town. So, um, come here. Thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to ask you first of all how the project started, how it came about. Um, well, um, good evening everybody, Woo! 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 thank you so much for being here, it's a pleasure to see you all the time, but um, I've been a feminist ever since I can remember, and so, and I've never done a project that, were more, that was more obviously feminist, and um, about four years ago, I, when things started to go, started to go a bit more sour in Brazil, I don't know if you guys have heard about the amazing not um, <laughs> president that we have, um, um, a fascist called Bolsonaro, he is, um, you know, when all of that started to, to boil and they started to think about taking down the very few rights that women have in Brazil, I was like, I've got to do something about this because this is absolutely ridiculous. And so women took to the streets and they started to change what now is the, the name of the book, um, Pela Vida das Mulheres, For the Life of All Women. Um, and so many millions of women um, throughout the country went to the streets and I'm, I'm here in the UK and I'm like, what can I do? And so I was like, I have to do a project about this. And um, so I wrote a text, um, kind of like an open call to women uh, in Brazil. And uh, I sent it over to 60 different women that I knew uh, personally or that I knew of, um, asking them that it, if they had gone through this, um, asking them to collaborate with me, but also asking them that uh, when you're faced with this choice, you are pregnant and you don't want to, you don't have the time to consider. Because if it is illegal, you have to take an action now. Because you have to, to see if you have enough money, and if you have enough money, then where are you going to do it? You go, it's something legal, so you have to ask around, you have to find the people that wouldn't uh, call the police, because many do. 
many many would call the police so you have to it has to be people that you trust and if you do have uh, uh, money and if you know enough people to take you to a place that will be safe fantastic but if that's not the case you're going to spend the next three months you know until you are probably around 12 weeks um, just desperate to do it to find a way to do it so they uh, uh, it's um, for many people, they don't have the time to even think about the possibility of not having it. And that's actually what happened in Uruguay, which is our, our a little bit more empathetic. And so perhaps they can be that those women could be their sisters, their mothers, their cousins, their friends, and that um, this should be something that we all should talk about. That this is to open a debate. This is to make people... Uh, obviously change their minds eventually hopefully but uh it's to make this a possibility it's to to put it out there because nobody would that's what i kept thinking when i was doing this project it was one of the the drives i had because i had so many problems with this project throughout these three and a half years but i kept thinking if i don't do this who will who will will get pregnant and women will seek abortions. It's just how they have that abortion that actually changes. It doesn't change the numbers. And what happens uh, in many cases in legalizing abortion is that you also open up family planning services, um, access to contraception, access to education. You destigmatize also the social uh, stigma around abortion. And so women, although it is always a there's always some sort of, it's always a very personal experience in the sense that it's not that you legalize it and suddenly it's okay to share with your boss maybe that you've had an abortion, but you do open it up to sharing with your friends or your family and that as well is a passing on of knowledge and education and experience that makes it okay and I Honestly, I just don't know why it's why it's why we're. I think it's wonderful that we're having this discussion, but it's still um, it boggles my mind that we have to in this day and age between the women population. I think it's women's rights, immigration, and uh, minorities. They're the you can get a rise out of. You can divide it. It's it's basically divide and conquer, and it's the easiest way to go in. Um, you, because then you can you can rile people up emotionally about um, their religion or rights or imagine if this was and it's usually it's mostly men because that's just the way that many of our governments are mm -hmm. but it it comes down to just pure ego I think and my party's winning yours not and it's just the easiest it's the most recent thing so it's an it's a toy it's not sort of some of it's constitutional, but it's not. It's sort of still within the debating realm of debate. Um, and so why not? Like, why not? Why not show that we are super Christian, so we're going to, if this comes, thing goes back to religion, and so we're going to remove this right because it's, it's just crazy. I think it's purely like divide and conquer. The idea that we think about these rollbacks on reproductive rights is not existing in a vacuum. You know, the rise of the far right is a rise of um, the misogynist far right. And, and I get really frustrated every time I hear conversations about it that we're not talking about the misogyny that is present within kind of white supremacy and stuff. Um, and I mean, for for years, you know, cross have have argued that if if um, the anti-choices movement was really about life, you'd see them protesting, you know, uh, child detention centres or child services or that kind of thing, and I do, you don't see them often, often there. Um, and I actually, I read something recently that was in a really interesting poll that polled some anti-choices about their uh, opinions about lots of different things, but particularly about gender equality. And they, across the board, men and women who were anti-choices in the state, sorry, they were extremely hostile towards gender, uh, gender equality of any kind of any kind of thing. So I think it's important that we think about these issues not just not just the silo, but in this in this vacuum. And as you said, um, women women's rights are the easiest ones to start picking off um, from those ones there. I'm pretty sure I have a clip from. I'm now using the body shops blusher. Um, I am pretty sure I've got a clip of me being trying to vlog but being really anxious. <laughs> 
that's not funny but it's kind of funny now I'm past it but uh, yeah I just woke up with this every time I come back from London I, I do feel exhausted um and so yeah Thursday I, I just felt so anxious I could barely do anything um apart from work I could work fine but the idea of recording myself working and I just wanted to focus on my work so I did that Friday I finished off writing a piece for Shadow Magazine um, which was super fun it's about art as advocacy and it really just made me really think I never really stop and think about what I do I just kind of do it and so stopping and thinking about what I do and why I do it and why it's important just like it just made me realise that I don't acknowledge um, what I do or celebrate the successes that I do that I hit very often but I don't ever like stop and appreciate what I've done oh and then I'm using gosh I'm pretty sure it's called draping but what I like to do is use the same colour as on my lips in different parts of my face anyway so that's it thanks so much for watching and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos from me and yeah bye done Boom. Mm -hmm.